Um, so I've got a pretty straightforward question, but I know it can spin off into several facets. But uh, to make it brief, uh, in reviewing uh, Matthew, I think it's 19.9, with Jesus speaking about divorce and remarriage. I've been reading and studying this quite a bit um, in the past year from a personal standpoint. And it seems like I'm finding everything from uh, hyper-legalistic to, you know, you can never remarry to, you know, people that almost seem like they're taking advantage of, of God's grace. So wanted to find out what do you feel is scripturally accurate regarding divorce, remarriage, adultery, because um, it sounds like in scripture, you know, except for if your spouse dies or uh, cheats on you, then you have to remain married regardless of the situation and remarriage is prohibited. So I've, I've heard a lot of arguments on both sides and just wanted to hear um, your opinion. Well, I believe context is everything. And when Jesus is talking about marriage in the book of, uh, in the in the Gospels, I mean, he spoke many times about it. Uh, he's talking about a Levitical marriage, not about marriage today that we have. Because today, Bill and Fred can get married. And then yeah. Bill and Fred, as they're married, uh, he come, uh, Bill comes home early and catches him with Alvin. Now he has grounds for a divorce biblically. No. In in Bible, they're not married, period. Well, it's legal. No, it's not biblical. So we have to look at that. Now, first of all, we want to look at a couple of things. What was a Levitical marriage? There was a lot of things that went on in a Levitical marriage. One, the families knew each other for a long period of time. Many times they were actually betrothed when they were actually uh, in their in their uh, early teens. Even when they were children, they would be betrothed. Um, you find that there would be any objection by the father uh, if she got a mar- She went ahead and got married and got a divorce. She wasn't guilty of a divorce. She was guilty of being disobedient to her father. Uh, when you look at what we call marriage today. Um, most marriages today do not fit the biblical protocol. Number two, polygamy was allowed. Which of the Old Testament patriarchs, Old Testament kings, including David, didn't have more than one wife? You didn't divorce a wife in those days. You built her little house out and back and married somebody else. Friends, this is the Bible. I'm not making this up. Which of the Old Testament patriarchs didn't have more than one wife? We talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you realize they came from uh, uh, Joseph, excuse me, Jacob and and uh, his two wives and their handmaidens? When you stop to really look at this, this is a lot different than what we do. Now, we have an idea in the church today about marriage, but it's not a Levitical marriage, it isn't based upon an idea where if this one really wants to be foul, I can go marry somebody else. You couldn't be a pastor if you had more than one wife. Paul tells us when he's writing to Timothy, the husband of one wife. I believe that is, a, again, that, that comes from the Old Testament, where if you were a priest serving God in the temple, husband of one wife as well. But again, understanding what a biblical marriage was. Now, again, polygamy was not prohibited. Uh, And so you could go out and marry somebody else. Now, when somebody says, well, uh, 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 divorce is the unpardonable sin, show me where that says that. In fact, well, well, God hates divorce, the Bible says. That's true, he does. I don't think there's any, any debate about that. But the Bible also says, Six things God hates and seven are an abomination to him. Do you know divorce is not listed there? But those that cause dissension, a gossipy tongue, those that sow discord among the brethren, God says he hates that. Just like he would hate divorce. So you would have to say if God hates divorce and that's the unforgivable sin, then if you're going to apply your exegeta of scripture, you'd have to also say then that the seven things that God hates, seven being an abomination to him, would also be unforgivable as well. So all of a sudden now this takes on a different thing. I believe that Jesus Christ will forgive us whatever we ask him for forgiveness for. There's none righteous, no, not one. And I've seen people say, well, I've never been divorced. Well, maybe your problem is pride. Maybe it's not being divorced. 
Because for some reason you think something you did or didn't do makes you more spiritual than somebody else. When if you really read the Bible, you know the only good thing in you and me is Jesus. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Paul says no good thing dwells in the flesh. It's not our righteousness that gets us into heaven. It's Jesus dying on the cross for us. And he covers our sins. So I really believe, John, to answer your question, we have to look at all the verses that pertain to this topic. I've just touched on a few of them. Yes, God hates divorce. It takes two to make a marriage. It takes one to make a divorce. But that one that makes the divorce can be nasty. The one that causes divorce can be beating their 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 spouse. Oh God, but you know, I got all my teeth knocked out by my husband, but praise Jesus, I'm still staying at home. The Bible doesn't say that. The God the Bible says God's not appointed us to 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 that kind of punishment. But see, because people are legalistic, they think they go to heaven because they crossed all, all the T's and dotted all the I's. Look at me. I'm Captain Shiny Buttons. Oh, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. That makes me better than you. No, it just simply tells me that that person's full with pride. You know, Jesus warned. He said, don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye when you got a beam in your own. And I think a lot of times the church beats up a lot of people that Jesus Christ would never beat up. The woman caught in adultery that was thrown at Jesus' feet. He wrote two times in the dirt. And we don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand. He might have wrote in the sand all the women that they fantasized about are men. They might, he might have wrote in the sand, how did you catch her? Because it said that we caught her in the very act. You did. How did you do that? Were you looking through her windows? Were you guys peeping toms? By Levitical law, it says the man was also supposed to be brought as well. They both stood in the judgment together, which was stoning, by the way. Maybe he wrote in the sand, where's the man? If you caught her in the very act, the man had to be there. Or was it all just a setup? Did they set this woman up so they could bring her to Jesus to see if Jesus would violate what the law says? And Jesus said, "Without those without sin cast the first stone. And it says they left. And then Jesus looked at the woman and said, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none, Lord. She called him Lord. Probably one of the shortest salvation prayers in the Bible. And he said, well, good. Go and sin no more. That was a woman in adultery. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, you're damned forever, dear. Uh, You're never going to get to uh, ever get married. Uh, You're never going to get to uh, have a family. Uh, You're just, you're done. What did he say? He said, go and sin no more. So I think from the words of Jesus, I think we can pretty much apply that God, Jesus' blood covered all of us for all of our sins. There's none righteous, no, not one. And when I get around a captain shiny buttons that thinks there's something because of their meticulous lifestyle, all I can tell you is the same thing Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Go sell what you have, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. Remember, he came to Jesus and and, and he said, what do I got to do? And he said, he said, keep the commandments. And he says, I've done all these since I was young. He says, only one thing you lack. Sell what you have, give the money to the poor, come and follow me. And it says, it says he went away sad because he was wealthy. You know what's really weird? Jesus said, it's not that you call me, it's that I called you. He said that to his disciples. Now, there are people that read scripture bad, out of context, and say, oh, uh, Jesus is called only, it is not that you call me, I call you. So so see, uh, Calvinism is true. No, he said that to his disciples. Jesus didn't call everybody that he saved to be a disciple. Uh, the the man of Gadara, who he delivered the demons from, that man wanted to follow Jesus. He says, I'll follow you wherever you go, he said. He says, no, you stay here and tell him the great things that God has done for you. He wouldn't let him come. We remember Matthew Levi, Receipt of Customs. He looked at him and says, 
follow me. He didn't give him a, a long dissertation. He just said, follow me. Matthew dropped what he had and followed him. Well, what's weird is that Jesus invited the rich young ruler to be one of his disciples. Come and follow me, he said. Same thing he said to, to Matthew Levi. Here's a rich young ruler. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. He had all the things that everybody wants. And Jesus said, come and follow me instead. And he went away sad. And I think that's interesting because we never know who that guy was. He had money, he was rich, and he was a ruler, but we don't know who he is. But those that follow Jesus, your name will live forever. Your thoughts, Dan? Yes, here's a common question, isn't it, Mike, about marriage and remarriage in the church? And uh, certainly the tradition of the church over the years has been one husband, one wife, and particularly for leadership. But, uh, you know, there is that provision made, certainly, in Matthew 19, where it says, who has ever put away his life except for fornication, marry another is committing adultery. So, you know, Jesus, in the whole context of the thing, he says, not all men can receive this. I, I believe that, you know, only to that which he has given. So he's, you know, accounting for the weakness of men, um, I think God's coming back for a pure bride, and the Word of God says that. So, But it's not by works of righteousness, as you pointed out, Mike, that we have done, that we saved it. But according to his mercy, he saved us, the washing of regeneration, new of the Holy Spirit. So it's a matter of living a pure life, uh, being faithful to death to your spouse, uh, but that's not going to get you to heaven. No. And, and again, I, I believe that... Um, uh, Jesus died for our sins. And, um, you know, King David said his promises are new every morning. And I pray that as uh, there's nothing more the devil wants to do than throw your past in your face. Yep. And and uh, you got to remember that, you know, uh, here, here's some more things about this. I mean, I mean, John, this is such a big topic. I could spend a couple hours on it. Uh, and, and we have other callers. But, you know, it's it's another thing. I know a guy and he... <laughs> did the Christian thing, married a Christian girl, uh, you know, you know, was serving God doing everything he was supposed to do. As soon as he married this girl, he stopped going to church. He stopped doing everything. She finds out that the guy's got kids in other States. He's wanted by police, all kinds of things in other States. Well, you married him and, and, and that's, uh, uh, you know, you're stuck with him. That isn't what the Bible says. That is fraud. And that goes back to the Levitical marriage. See, people misrepresent. It's like dating right now before you get married is like the great deceiver show. I, I, I'll tell them whatever I want to say. I'll do whatever I got to do to get them. Once I get them, then I can really let the real me show. Friends, that is deceit. Well, you married him. You got to stay with him. No, 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 no. When you go back to Levitical law, if you went into a marriage with fraud, it didn't take. See, this is one of the problems that we find today is people don't look at the whole Bible when they look at a topic. Well, the Bible says, you know, except for uh, fornication, you can't get divorced. So that means Bill and Steve can't get a divorce. No, you've got to look at what does the rest of the Bible say about marriage. And marriage is not between two of the same sex, the, two men, two women. No. So we have to look at all of it. And this is one of the great problems that we find today because most ministers don't read their Bibles. They read their Bible just to get a message on Sunday morning. They don't know what the Bible says. They did a survey, and I, I believe it was less than 10% of pastors regularly read their Bible. They only read their Bible to get a sermon on Sunday morning. Well, how are you going to teach God's Word if you don't know God's Word? You've got to read the Bible through several times. So you get it, oh, I remember that, what that said about that. Yeah, I remember Levitical marriage and all the, all the ingredients that went into that. And I remember, you know, all those things. Well, if you don't, if you don't, do that you you're not going to you're not going to give a balanced sermon you're going to give the sermon your denomination says this is what we believe our church dogma is what we preach not the word of god and friends we better start waking up man the world the world scene is changing 
We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus Christ said that. I believe that's so important that we do that. Hope that helps, John. 